descent Who has numbered every grain of sand Kings and nations tremble at his voice All creation rises to rejoice Come let us adore Him Behold a King Nothing can compare Come let us adore Him of sinful men God eternal humble to the grave Jesus Savior risen now to Nothing can compare Come let us adore
Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of His glory justice and mercy embrace there the son of god gave his life for us and our measureless debt was erased jesus to you we lift our eyes jesus It is Sunday again, so that means it's time to come as a church and praise and worship our King. So without further ado, let's get ready. Let praise awaken inside of every heart, for He is awesome, our God is awesome. Singing loud, for he is awesome. 
Oh, his name is above every name. His name is above all our circumstances. Oh, there is no fear, there is no fear.
this morning, Lord. Lord, may we be receptive and may we be ready, Lord, to hear what you have to say to us. I commit all my brothers and sisters into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. So good to be here to bring you the Word of God this morning. Now, let me ask you a question. During the pandemic, what is your response? Do you go out? Do you go mingle around freely? Or do you stay at home? Do you isolate yourself from others uh, until the pandemic is over? I think we all know the answer to that question, right? To be safe, to uh, prevent the virus from spreading to us and through us to other people. We all have been uh, more or less staying at home, keeping to ourselves for the past one and a half years already. Right? But in the midst of keeping ourselves safe from the virus, uh, what are we uh, paying as a cost? Right? Well, if you think about it, for sure there is an economic cost to it. Uh, there is also a social cost. Uh, there is also a cost to our mental health. Right? There's many things that we have had to sacrifice in a way to uh, put up with this pandemic. But I wonder, do we consider that there is a spiritual cost to us as well in the midst of staying safe in this pandemic? Right, I put it to you that there is a certain hidden danger in this pandemic, even as we isolate ourselves for our own physical safety, we can expose ourselves to the danger of uh, this spiritual ailment. Right, which we find spoken about in Hebrews 3, 7 to 19. So even as I read from the New King James Version, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my work forty years. 
Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, let there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not those who sinned? whose corpses fell in the wilderness, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Right? In the midst of the journey of the people of Israel in the wilderness, right? even as they journeyed through these many trials, these many challenges that they faced in the wilderness, you know, they developed a heart that was heart towards God that was stubborn in going against Him. Right? They easily put Him aside. They easily went astray from Him you know, because of the unbelief that it says in their hearts. Right? And during this pandemic, can we fall victim to the same hardening of hearts of the people of Israel or not? Right? I think that's something that we have to be aware of. Right? To first understand, to, to, firstly to understand that Right, we've got to see what is the journey of the people of Israel. And we find that uh, beginning from Exodus 17. Now, in Exodus 17, the people of Israel have already uh, come out from Egypt. They have already crossed the Red Sea, you know, and they are on their way to the Promised Land. Right, an extraordinary long journey. And he says, then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and came in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water so that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why is it that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now, put yourself in the shoes of the children of Israel, right? And ask yourself, you know, if you were in such a situation, what would be your response? Right? If you were brought on a long journey, you know, you come from a place where, all right, life is tough, life is hard, you are a slave, you're doing manual labor day in, day out. But at the same time, there is a consistency about it. Right? You know that you know, the food is provided for you, the drink is provided for you, the shelter is provided for you. There is a steady employment. You are always going to be going into work day in and day out. Right? So there is a certain expectation of life and of normalcy that they have come to have. Right? But all of a sudden, they are taken out of that and then they are facing a constant struggle in their life every day now because they don't know okay, whether each day where the food is going to come from, where the water is going to come from, you know, they face before the armies of Pharaoh charging onto them, right, where they're literally, you know, between a rock and a hard place, right, behind them are the armies of Pharaoh, in front of them is the Red Sea, you know, certain death either way. So, you know, they live a life that is, I would say, you know, an uncertain life, a stressful life, a difficult life, right, quite similar, I think, to what we are going through. 
right? And as they journey through on this journey, on each day there is this question of survival hanging over their heads and there's a question of uncertainty of, you know, how long is this journey going to last? I know that there is this promise of a better life, of a better land for us, but we don't see that. You know, when is it coming, right? So put yourself in their shoes and ask yourself, being faced with that situation and being brought by Moses, you know, the leaders to a place where there's no water, right? So what do they do? You know, I'm sure there is a very great stress, worry, you know, difficulty that they are facing. So is it, why is it so wrong for them to react, to complain, to cry out, Moses, you know, oh, what have you done? Why have you brought us here? Right? But let us look at it another way. We know that God has saved the Israelites from slavery, right? They brought them, God brought them out from Egypt, you know, through many signs and wonders and miracles to let Pharaoh release the hole on them. And then even as they journey out, you know, the manna is provided to them, even quail is provided to them, even there is a pillar of cloud by day, even there is a pillar of fire by night, you know, leading them, even when they got to the Red Sea, even when the armies of Pharaoh were charging down on them, God made a way through the sea for them and as they crossed through safely and at the end, you know, the sea came upon the army that was threatening them and eliminated their enemies, right? And as they journey, continued their journey, you know, God continued to provide for them, you know, to show His love for them, His care for them and, you know, this is the experience of their life, right? Supernatural protection, supernatural provision. So in the midst of all of this, coming to this place, this day of trial, you know, I believe that God will have that expectation of them. See what I have done for you over all these years. See the faithfulness that I've demonstrated to you. See the, the love that I pour out to you, right? And, you know, by now you should know who I am. I am Jehovah Jireh, your provider. You know, I am your saviour. I am the one who brought you out of oppression. Right? But, and yet, he says that, you know, the, the disappointing thing is that, you know, they always go astray. They have not known my ways. Even after all this time of me providing for them or loving them, they have not known my ways. Right? So, this is the situation that we find the Israelites in. And it says that, you know, in Hebrews 3, right, it says that in the day of trial in the wilderness, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on that day, on that one fine day. Right? And church, even as we go through this pandemic, you know, I believe all of our experiences are different. Right? All of our challenges are different. But in many ways, we are all experiencing the same things as well. You know, I'm sure there is struggle. You know, as you go through this, there's a lot of changes going on. There's a lot of adaptation that you had to do, right? And it wouldn't have been easy on any one of us. I don't think even for those, even the most wealthy, you know, who have their challenges, of course, they have their wealth to fall back on. So what about even those who are not so well off, right? The challenges that they face. So there's so many challenges that we face. And, you know, as we go along, right, I believe that, okay, you know, on a, any given day, Right? We're trying to make the most of it as we go along, day by day, week by week, month by month. You know, it wears us down, doesn't it? You know, it has an effect on us. Right? It's like uh, water you know, that drips down day by day by day. You know, if, if that's you know, for a short period of time, it doesn't have much effect. Right? But even rocks, even you know, uh, solid structures. You have that kind of constant pressure, even a small drip of water over time, it has this effect, it can wear it down, right? So this pandemic is like, you know, a constant wearing down of us mentally, you know, physically, socially, you know, emotionally, right? Even spiritually, it does take a toll on us, right? And there will be that day that one fine day, right, which is the day of trial, where just somehow, you know, on top of everything that we are facing, just 
things just go wrong and wrong and wrong and we just, oh, I just had enough. You know, I can't take this anymore. There is a breaking point. You know, I believe that, you know, the Israelites reached this breaking point. And then, and this day of trial, and this day of testing, you know, it came to light. Okay, what has the effect of this long journey been on them all this while? Right? It has not cultivated in them a sense of faith, of belief in God, but rather it has had the opposite effect. Right? That in that, it builds upon the doubt, upon doubt of God to the point where one fine day they're ready to say that, that's it, enough is enough, I've had enough. Right? So this is the danger for us, church, in this pandemic, first of all, that you know, we don't realize but we can, the effect of this pandemic can be on us that you know, day by day by day is building up in us a sense of hardening of our heart. And this hardening of our heart is a sense of stubbornness, you know, of wanting to go our own way or doing our own thing, right? of walking away from God. If God says one thing, it guides us, leads us in one direction for us, it's like, you know, coming to a point where no, you know, I'm more and more being convinced that God's way is not my way, that my way is the way, right? And it says that, you know, so there will be this leading astray, right? We don't just, it's never that we decide to walk away from God, but there's always something else that entices us away from God, right? And what allows us to be enticed away from God ultimately is unbelief. Right, lack of confidence in God. You know, in this past few months, we have a lot of talk about confidence or no confidence in our you know, Prime Minister, right? And ultimately, our Prime Minister came down and there was a new Prime Minister. You know, because of the lack of confidence of the people in him, such that he lost the support. And when he lost the support, then he cannot continue on with the mandate anymore. Well, God is not like that. Right? God doesn't need our confidence to continue to be God in the universe. But God needs to have our confidence to continue to rule in our life. Because once we lose confidence in God, once we have that unbelief in God, then we will no longer continue in His way, but then we will go our own way. So this is, in a nutshell, the first rebellion and the first trial. Right, in that the journey that the people of Israel went on brought them to a place of unbelief which was exposed on the day of trial and therefore that place was called the place of complaining and that was called the place of testing. And sadly, the people of Israel failed that test miserably. But you might think to yourself that, okay, you know, this is the people of Israel, right? But I think that, you know, I'm a long-time Christian. I've been walking with God, you know, for many years already. In fact, you know, I'm one of the leaders on the church. I'm one of the key members on the church. You know, those members are the ones that look up to me, you know, and I'm the one who's, you know, at the forefront spiritually, right? So does this apply to me, right? Or is it just for the people? Let's look at the second instance of this happening in Numbers 20. It's almost, almost the, the exact same situation. But then there is something more. Right? And let's, let's look into it. It says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, that came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. See, they are no longer in the wilderness of Sin, but they are in the wilderness of Zin. Right? Similar place, but different. And it's in the first month, the people stayed in Kadesh and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness? that we and our animals should die here. And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. No, is there any water to drink? So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and they fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. 
Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and the animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the, people, the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. Now, for us, you know, reading the first story and we read the second story, right, it's almost the same but with one key difference. Can you spot it? It's that Moses and Aaron received an instruction from God but then they did not carry out the instruction. And in not carrying out the instruction, then they brought down a very severe punishment upon themselves. Right? And it showed their own unbelief and you know, looking at this it's a wake-up call for me you know i believe that it's a wake-up call for all of us who might think that you know i can't possibly have a heart of unbelief towards god hey you know have you ever heard it said in the bible that moses has a heart of unbelief towards god right if you read the bible if you know the whole story of the Bible and even when we read the New Testament right, and we think back on Moses, surely Moses, the great hero, the great leader, the one who brought the commandments of God you know, and established the old covenant right, that all of Israel held on to so dearly right, and subsequently all the rules and regulations that were established, they were established by Moses. He is the father of this nation in a way. You know, and yet, right, if we look at this story and we see that even Moses fell victim to the sin of unbelief. In, he let unbelief enter into his heart and he paid a very dear price for it. Surely, we've got to learn from this, church. Now, we see that you know, God spoke to Moses and he said to Moses, speak to the rock. Now, what did Moses do? Right, Moses, first of all, you know, he gathered the people and he rebuked the people. He spoke to the people and he challenged the people and he said, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Right? I would imagine if I put myself in Moses' shoes, you know, having put up with them, with their constant complaining, with their you know, time and time again, questioning his leadership, you know, questioning him you know and his intentions towards them in spite of all that he has done for them from beginning to end right surely he will have a sense of frustration already surely he will have a sense of wow oh, these people are so ungrateful you know and right on on one hand you know that frustration against the people on the other hand the feeling of the need to prove himself to say that you know i deserve to be your leader because of all that I have done for you. Right? And so, in this frame of mind, instead of speaking to the rock, Moses spoke to the people and he said, must we bring water for you out of the rock? And he took the rock and he struck the rock just as he did in the first instance and water came out of the rock. Right? So does this vindicate him? It's like, wow, you know, Moses did it. It's not, you know, it's not God who did it, but it's Moses who did it because God said, speak to the rock. Right? But Moses struck the rock and the water came out. Wow, he must be feeling you know, vindicated. Like, yeah, you know, you can't question my leadership anymore. But you see, leadership is not for the people. But leadership is the responsibility that God has given to him. Right? His legitimacy, his authority, his leadership was not conveyed by the people. Whether they accept him or whether they reject him, we know that people are fickle-minded 
right? And you might be the hero one day, but you might be the zero the next day already, you know? But God ultimately is the one that approves us, you know, especially more, more than anything, those of us who are in leadership in the church, right? Our leadership is from God and God will give it and God is the one who can remove us as well. So in our leadership, let us not look at the people, but let us look at God. You know, let us look at pleasing God. Right? And in this case, when Moses came before God, you know, God spoke a very damning word against him. He said, because you did not believe me, you did not have faith in me. Right? You decided to do it in the tried and tested way that you thought that you know, the method is the thing that brings the thing out, right? It's the method. Even methods that are given to us by God and has worked so successfully, miraculously in the previous times. We cannot, we can never elevate this above God, right? And even if God tells you something that is so outside of what you think is possible, you know, God wants us to follow His instructions, right? And to give the glory to Him, you know, but in this situation, Moses took the glory for himself. Moses wanted the glory for himself. Moses wanted to show the people that, ha, huh, see, I am still qualified to be your leader. But in doing that, you know, he took the glory that was meant for God and he applied it to himself, which God said that, you know, you should never do that. You should hello me. You should glorify me. You should lift my name up in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not enter into the promised land. You shall not enter into you know, my promised rest. And that to me you know, is a very sobering thought that we as leaders, you know, we can never think that we are above it all. But in every time know that we can be even more in danger because, you know, you might think that you're not in danger when you really are in danger. Right? So how do we overcome this danger of hardening of our hearts, of unbelief entering into our hearts? Right? I'm so glad that we are reading out of Hebrews 3 and not Psalm 95 where this originates from. Right? Seven, you know, verses 7 to 11 is actually taken from Psalms 95 verse 7. But when it's taught in Hebrews 3, so the writer gives us the exposition, you know, the, the solution to this problem. It's not just talking about the problem, it's talking about the solution. And the solution is threefold, starting from verse 12. Firstly, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. First of all, we've got to know that there is this danger and beware of it. Be aware of it and beware of it. Right? If we think that we cannot fall to this, then we are cheating ourselves. Right? And we are not aware of the danger. But in knowing the danger, then we can be cautious of it. Right? Because we can develop an evil heart of unbelief in us. You know, the Bible says, right, in Deuteronomy 31, 8, and in many other places, it says, you know, God will never leave you and He will never forsake you. But does it say, God will never let you leave Him and God will never let you forsake Him? No, right? Because that will be quite scary, actually. That's kind of like we are a prisoner, you know. God, once God has us in His hands, I'm never letting go of you, right? It's not like that, you know. We have our free will, in a way, right? To choose Him or not choose Him. And, you know, even though God will never leave us, nor forsake us, but in our unbelief, we can leave God and we can forsake God. There is a danger of that. So we need to be aware of that and beware of that. Right? Watch out for that. Secondly, verse 13. You know, it says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, 
lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And in this one verse, I will say this is the crux of my message, especially in this time. Because if you think about it, what have we gotten so good at doing in the last one and a half years? We have gotten very good at being by ourselves, right? For those of you, you know, who are married, probably it's just you and your spouse, if you have kids, with your kids, if you're living with your parents, with your parents, but it's a very small family unit and the times that we mingle around really, you know, connect and do life on life with other believers is really slim to none nowadays compared to what we have before, right? If you think about, you know, back in those days, seems like so long ago, but, you know, we have been in church, mingling. After, it, after church, you have makan time, you know, you have cell group, you're meeting together in cell group. Once in a while, you go out, have outings, catch up, meet up, and so on. There's so much social interaction going on in the midst of all this social interaction there is also a spiritual interaction going on right but the one thing that we have gotten so used to doing now is just you know being on our own right and the more this pandemic drags on the more and more we have you know people talk about having fatigue of having zoom of having you know group meetings of calling people video calls and so on it's just, you know, after a while, you just feel like, ah, actually, I can do without this, right? And we gradually get used to, you know, less and less and less social contact until perhaps even now, if we want to get back into that life again, you know, it's not part of our normal routine anymore, right? For me, if I think about a normal week, I will go to work, I will come back from work, I will be at home, you know, at home, we will just be, you know, having dinner, after having dinner, perhaps we let the kids watch some TV, you know, we do some house chores or we reach out ourselves on the phone, you know, and after that, get the, get the kids uh, showered, you know, bedtime, stories, routine, so on, and then sleep, and then wake up, and it's the same thing again. I don't think about, I want to call up this and that person, I want to meet up with this and that person, have social activities, I don't think about that, right? Perhaps I'm an anomaly, you know. I'm the kind of person that probably needs less social interaction than a normal human being, I would think, right? And I'm also blessed in a way that, you know, in my work, right, I work with my family, so I see my dad on a regular basis. I see one of my brothers on a regular basis. You know, I have certain amount of social interaction during the day. I think it's enough for me. Right? But it's a far cry from what it used to be. I'm sure all of us are experiencing the same thing now. Right? Such that when I read this passage, it says, you know, exhort one another daily while it's called today. And I think to myself, how? You know, that's not what I'm used to anymore. That's not my routine anymore. That's, you know, is that even safe to do? Right? Is that even what we are allowed to do? All these questions come into our mind. And yet, this is the word of God that is timeless, that is for all time. And it says to us, exhort one another daily while it is called today. Why? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, in this isolation that we find ourselves in, yes, physical isolation, but also mental isolation, emotional isolation, social isolation, and spiritual isolation. This is the perfect condition for the enemy, you know, for sin to come and to have opportunities to deceive us, to work in our life, and to create that hardened heart, to create that heart of unbelief in us. If we continue to isolate ourselves and isolate ourselves and isolate ourselves, how do you know sometimes the emotions that you're facing, sometimes the thoughts that you're having, sometimes the things that you're going through, how, how it's framed and how you begin to accept it and so on is the deceitfulness of sin at work, right? Telling you that, oh, life is just terrible. You know, life is just hopeless. You know, things are not going to get any better. Nobody cares about you. Nobody loves you. You know, even God has abandoned you. 
You know, what's this life all about? What's the meaning of this life? You know, these are the things that can creep into our thoughts, into our being, and sooner or later, it becomes our reality, right? Because there's, if there's no one that is, you know, external from us to call us out and say that, hey, you know, how are you doing? What are you thinking lately? What are you experiencing lately? And, you know, how are you doing emotionally? You know, how are you doing mentally? How are you doing spiritually? Then, you know, we fester in our own thoughts, we fester on our own emotions, and we fall, you know, as time goes on, it's inevitable. It's inevitable that we will be negatively affected spiritually. And from the spiritual aspect flows into all these other aspects of our life. Right? So we got to be careful of this. And the antidote to this is, like it or not, you know, we have to exhort one another daily. You know, the parallel passage to this, I look at Hebrews 10, 25 to 26. And it says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. You know, the people in the time of the just when all these epistles are being written, right? They're not living their best life, you know, life is great, everything is you know, so good going out and freely doing anything. They were living under persecution. Right? They were living under the very real threat of their life. Right? If that, you know, they have a wrong kind of meeting and it stir up the attention of the wrong kind of people, then it can even lead to their death. Right? And yet, you know, and that's why the writer of Hebrews is saying that, you know, there's some people who are in the manner of, okay, let's not meet up together because, you know, this is dangerous and, you know, if we have found meeting together and something bad will happen to us and it may even cost us our life. So let's, you know, keep our distance for a while until this whole thing blows over and then we come together and meet again, right? But he says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together even in this time of persecution, even in this time of crisis. Let us meet together, exhort one another and so much more and more as you see the day approaching. I tell you, the day is so much closer now than it is back when Hebrews 10 was written. Right? We're very much living close to the last days. And yet it says that let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So perhaps as we come to this time, right, it's time for us to rethink now. Okay, you know, we've gone through the pandemic. We've gone through lockdowns. We've gone through all these things that prohibit us from meeting together with one another such that we are so used to it now, but there is a danger of us in our isolation that there is a heart that is hardened, as a heart that is unbelieving, that has begun to you know, have an effect on us. So knowing that, we better do something about it. We better make it a daily thing so long as it's called today to stir up one another, to look out for one another, to exhort one another, to say that, hey, how are you doing spiritually? You know, how's everything? And, you know, connect and encourage one another and say, you know, don't be discouraged and don't believe the lies of the enemy. Right? Let us go on. Let us go on in this journey of faith. Let us believe God who has you know, begun the good work in us, he will finish the good work in us. Which leads me to my third point. It says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You know, and we need to know that we are in this for the long haul. Right? We are not going to give up halfway in this journey because that is the mark of a true believer is that our confidence will last us from beginning to end. Right? If, imagine if you start out on your journey driving your car, you're going from you know Kuching to Miri. Right? You better hope, and uh, not better hope, but you better prepare the sufficient amount of petrol in your car so that you can go all the way from Kuching to Miri without running out of fuel. Right? And what this passage is telling us is that you know we need to see out this journey with Christ to the end. Let us see it out to the end. You know, and 
to encourage you. We're not alone in this journey. You know, when I think about this issue, it can be that God is, we can think of God like a spectator, right? God is looking on at our life. It's like, okay, I wonder which ones of you will make it, right? During this pandemic, as I said, you know, we keep to ourselves, right? One thing that Florence and I have come to like to watch is those reality shows, you know, reality shows like Master Chef, uh, like The Voice, you know, where, whereby you have a competition and you have a group of people joining the competition and week after week you see people being eliminated from the com competition until finally in the grand final week, you know, there's this true two or three people who are so outstanding and then, you know, finally one of them is crowned the champion, they are the winner and they made it, you know, and they enter into the reward and the rest of them all just fall aside into obscurity. Right, and we are all, you know, watching on and wondering, okay, who's going to make it? Who's not going to make it? And sometimes as we read this kind of passage, you know, we can have this wrong idea that God is like that also, that God is a spectator far off watching on in our lives and seeing, oh, who's going to make it? Who's not going to make it? It's not like that, right? We look at 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 9. It says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by, by Him in all utterance and all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? If we look at this passage, we see that God plays a very, very, very active role in this journey of our faith. Right? Same like the Israelites. You know, as the Israelites go along in their journey, God also provided them with sustenance day in and day out, right? God also provided them with direction with a pillar of uh, cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when there's threats against them, God put aside the threats. But all that God called the people to do is to walk faithfully with Him, to walk in step with Him. And this is also the journey that God has called us on, right? God has a direction for us. God has a provision for us and God has instruction for us day by day. Uh, God's desire for us and expectation for us is that we walk faithfully with Him just as He has been faithful with us and He will always be faithful to us. Remember, He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. Right? So let us not leave Him. Let us not forsake Him through a heart of unbelief but let us walk steadfastly from beginning to to the end by His grace, by His mercy. You know, applying everything that we have learned in this passage, right? Guarding our hearts against stubbornness and unbelief. You're encouraging one another in faith and good works, you know, looking out for one another, calling each other out, right? And holding on to our faith by His grace. And in this, you know, I believe right, that we need to really understand the gravity of you know, this very real but very much, I think, hidden danger in this time. That we're not be so used to the isolation that we are facing, but even to continue to challenge it and continue to align our lives with His Word to say that I will not you know, isolate myself, but I will make an active role to connect and be connected to my brothers and sisters, my leaders in the church and those that I am leading in the church so that none will fall by the wayside but all will see out this journey to the end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your rhema word, your living word. And even in this time and situation that we find ourselves in, even as we are looking out for our own safety and our own health, but Lord, indeed I pray that we will not neglect our spiritual health for the sake of our physical health. 
But Lord, you help us to be mindful of the danger of the hardening of our hearts and the unbelief that may enter into our hearts that may lead us away from you, Lord. But Lord, in this time, let us be mindful of this danger and let us encourage one another. Let us be connected with one another, encouraging one another, being a true community of believers, looking out for one another that none will fall away through the deceitfulness of sin. But Lord, let us indeed spur each other on and walk together to see this journey out to the end. So Lord, I pray for every single one of the listeners this morning and I pray that this will be a word that speaks to them and more importantly, that will work a change in them, in our hearts, in me, so that we would not be so focused on ourselves, Lord, but we look out for one another in this time. You know my pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Church. We bless you. We hope to see you again soon. Physically, I believe that it won't be long to go. And when that time comes, I believe that there is so much good catching up to do. And we know that God is with us always. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to our service today. If you have never entered into a relationship with Jesus, we want you to know that God loves you so much that He gave His only Son to die on the cross for all of your sins that stood between you and God. If you would like to make the decision to follow Jesus today, repeat this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner and there's nothing I can do to save myself. Lord, I choose to be made right with you and to follow you today. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask that you forgive me from all of my sins. Lord, I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord and Saviour of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer for the first time, or if you have a testimony or prayer request to share, we would love to hear from you. Visit us on Facebook at Emmanuel Baptist Church Coaching Online. God bless. Hallelujah.